I don't really think I can follow that. It's just coming on after an, an example of uh, pure heroism and then talking about my adventures down the PowerPoint mine. Um, <laughs> isn't going to look all that great. If I can have the next slide. Um, very quick question first. It's often said that only about three or four people predicted the financial crash four years ago. What's actually meant by predicted there is people came up with mathematical and economic models which proved to some people's, you know, reasonable acceptance uh, using mathematical models, using historical data and so forth, that actually there was something fundamentally wrong. I would argue actually that most of you in this room predicted the financial crash. Everybody who'd had their house bought by, you know, the seventh banker to move into the street. Everybody who'd seen a whole generation leave universities, 80% of whom went into financial services of some kind. All of you will have actually predicted it. The problem is you predicted it instinctively rather than with a mathematical model. The way you predicted it was probably using a very interesting heuristic which we use actually all the time, and we use it very intelligently. And that heuristic, put very bluntly, is if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. And we use it, and it's not rational, but if most of you went out into the street this evening and somebody offered to sell your Rolls Royce for £5,000, most of you would, in defiance of economic good sense, most of you would actually refuse, on the grounds that it just seems too good to be true, there's bound to be a catch attached. The problem is, is that we have a culture of decision-making which, I think a problem exacerbated since the invention and proliferation of the spreadsheet, values numerical reasoning and rationality above everything else. And I think this is actually crippling us because it is impossible now to instigate a new government policy or initiative without an extraordinary level of rational justification and modelling which is actually at some level inimicable to the even more scientific process of decent experimentation. This is an example from Frederick the Great. Uh, he wanted more Germans to grow and eat potatoes since having two sources of carbohydrate uh, would actually guarantee to some extent against violent fluctuations in food prices and therefore riots, but it will also actually uh, provide the population with some degree of insurance should one crop or other fail. And if you look at the economic effects on Europe of the cultivation of the potato, they in many cases caused the population to actually double over the next 30 to 40 years, so he wasn't fully wrong. He tried legislation, and it actually had the opposite effect to that intended. People said, look, dogs won't even eat the thing. They look, look like turds. Why on earth? Who do you think you are going around telling us peasants to eat the thing? So he tried behavioral economics and exploited something called scarcity bias. He declared that the potato was a royal vegetable and only members of the royal household could eat it. And he had a potato crop outside his palace, which was guarded night and day, but with secret instructions to the guards not to guard it very dil diligently. Psychology being as it is, when you're told that only kings can eat a potato, you want some of that for yourself. And sure enough, it wasn't long before um, underground potato dealing had actually sprung up, people sneaking into towns, opening their jackets and going, hey, mate, would you like to buy one of these tubers? <laughs> but the point about that is that's a piece of psychological design. It's a piece of behavioral design. Behavioral design you will not arrive at through strict rationality. You'll never get there. It requires either imaginative leaps, uh, accidental experimentation, or something of that kind. We're not allowed to do that anymore. If we go on to the next slide, um, first of all, there's a very strange bias that it's more fashionable to legislate than to actually persuade. The government has actually closed the COI, which is a slightly strange decision if you're a government that believes in nudging. But there is a strange psycholo psycho psychological thing, which is we regard that actually tangible solutions are somehow more noble than psychological ones. I had a friend who produced a, um, an anti-chip fat fire advertisement. It ran in one TV region where it reduced the incidence of chip fires by about 40% at a trivial cost. It never ran again, nor did it run anywhere else, because it's more fashionable for politicians to spend money treating third-degree burns than it is spending money on an advertising campaign that encourages people not to start fires in the first place. That seems to me a very strange bias, that we seem particularly suspicious of nudging, persuasion, sometimes called nannying. And that, I think, is, I, I think that's actually a fundamental problem, the fact that actually we regard these things with innate suspicion. I'm not sure we're wrong to be suspicious, but we're wrong to reject them out of hand. In the 50s, in the Madman era, there was an extraordinary guy uh, who was a Viennese psychologist who used to go to 
companies like Chrysler and point out to them that you don't actually need to make your cars faster. If you make the spring underneath the accelerator pedal stronger, 60 miles an hour feels faster. <laughs> now, at the, time that was, at the time, that was actually viewed as slightly scurrilous. But interestingly, the very, very same insight when given to Friends of the Earth or Greenpeace would now be seen as a very, very insightful environmental nudge. That actually, you don't need a fast car, you need a car that feels fast. And it's an important point. But there is a danger that in the absence of royalty and religion, we don't have a mechanism for what I call arbitrary but seemingly irrational interventions in society. So everything has to be justified and argued but actually, royalty, bizarrely, could play a very, very valuable marketing role. The whole business of vaccination and its predecessor was basically, which when you think about it, it's a deeply alien idea. The idea that you slightly infect yourself in order to protect yourself against something is, is shall we say, slightly counterintuitive. The reason it became acceptable in the UK was really because it was adopted as royal practice and then became a fashion. Argument would have completely failed. We also have the... Um, uh, I think the missing uh, tool of religion, which was, again, spectacularly good and spectacularly bad, but sometimes very good, and actually instigating what you might call the, the irrational but effective intervention. If we move to the next slide, heuristics are basically how the human mind works. It works instinctively beneath our level of consciousness. We use different heuristics in different occasions. They're rules of thumb. Uh, they don't actually obey strict mathematical laws. As you'll see, the best tennis, uh, the best cricket and baseball players don't actually solve quadratic equations when they're working out how to catch a ball. They use a heuristic, rather like if something's too good to be true, it probably it seems too good to be true, it probably is. They look at the angle of gaze and run towards the ball at whatever speed keeps that angle constant. It's mathematically impure, it's amazingly fast, and it's incredibly cognitively frugal. It works extraordinarily well. But the problem is, is that because we're actually, in a sense, tied down by the need for everything to be justified rationally, there are exceptions. There are extraordinary people like Steve Jobs who are allowed to break the rules through simple force of personality and because they're the founder of a company. You occasionally get a politician who enjoys some level of popular support. Uh, founders of businesses um, uh, often enjoy a kind of license to be irrational that isn't actually accorded to anybody else working in the business. But the danger is that actually, in order to actually understand heuristics and, and, and exploit that, it's probably best that, in many cases, we actually leave rationality behind. Rationality is very appropriate if you want to work out the surface area of a cone. For those very limited, next slide, the very limited situations in life where there is one inarguable, provable right answer. Areas such as physics, for example, engineering, where there is a mathematically calculable and verifiable right answer and a single right answer. Most of human life, anything involving psychology, meteorology, economics, or the interactions of multiple free agents, are basically cloud-like rather than clock-like, to use Popper's phrase. They don't actually obey Newtonian laws. They don't obey mechanistic rules. So the attempt, as Taleb says, to apply what's perfectly applicable in science to the rest of real life actually leads to some extraordinarily misapplication of effort. The license, actually, to be irrational in the solutions we, pr we actually propose is actually, I think, a necessary one. The license to actually experiment with creative solutions that apparently make no sense. Let me give a few examples here. Next uh, slide. The first behavioural economist, God. <laughs> Let me explain. If you want to help people reduce or keep within reasonable measure their alcohol consumption, the standard assumption was actually one rationally arrived at through calculation and through epidemiological studies. You work out a level at which most people can safely drink and you tell them it's 28 units for men, uh, 21 units for women, both suspiciously being a multiple of seven, I noticed. Um, and that's the, reasonable, <laughs> that's the reasonable weekly intake. No one will get fired for making that recommendation because it's rational. However, it's perfectly possible for something to be logical and slightly stupid. We need a new word in the English language which is stodgic, which is things that are apparently obey the rules of logic, but which the effects of which are actually stupid or unintelligent. And I would argue that's stodgic. Telling people actually drink 28 units a week is logical but stupid. It's incredibly easy to practice self-deception. You can convince yourself that that vast KFC-sized bucket of 14.9% Chilean Merlot is actually a single glass of wine and therefore constitutes a single unit. You can top your glass up 
Um, Self-deception is easy. You can also deceive other people who are trying to help you in limiting your drink consumption. Because unless your girlfriend or wife works for the Stasi, she's unlikely to ask you the depths of sort of questions that are necessary to police someone's unit consumption. <laughs> okay? It's also not socially self-reinforcing either. There's no capacity for social reinforcement in that measure. What the Scottish Parliament's suggesting, they probably have some experience of the problem, <laughs> is that actually there's a heuristic solution to the problem. Let's develop a heuristic which is, by and large, don't drink on two or three days of the week. Okay? Now, that's not perfectly logical. It would be theoretically possible to obey that prescription and still be a raging alcoholic. <laughs> However, in terms of what's actually useful, it's less logical but more intelligent. Why? It's easy to police. You can effectively say to your wife, no, don't forget, if I drink today, I'm not allowed to drink on Thursday. It can be socially self-reinforcing. A group of friends can agree not to drink on the same days of the week and can actually go out together and reinforce their not drinking this. It's very difficult to practice self-deception. Um, it's very easy to spot when you've cheated. It's very easy to spot when someone else has cheated. It actually works. And that's because it's a piece of behavioral design rather than a piece of rational design. And the reason God is the first behavioural economist is if you notice, when God wished wish to institute a working time directive, he didn't do what the French did and set a maximum of 35 hours a week. He said, on the seventh day you shall rest. <laughs> Pretty easy to spot a Sabbath breaker. Are you over there? What are you doing? The rabbi can actually police the Sabbath and it can become socially self-reinforcing and habituated in a way that a unit French measure simply can't. In France, if someone comes up to you and says, what are you doing working at 10 o'clock at night? You can just say, oh, I overslept this morning. <laughs> There's no clear measure. And that's why God is quite interesting, and why religion is quite interesting, because in amongst the stranger stuff, there is some actually very, very good behavioral intelligence. Jewish dietary law would be another example of this. Uh, here's the first um, classical economist. Next slide. That's Procrustes. <coughs> The man who was so convinced, he was so obsessed with the model, which was the length of his bed, that he either stretched people on a rack or cut their feet off in order to get them to fit the bed. In other words, the model and the purity of the model was deemed more important than the people for whom it was designed. And this is a problem with mathematical models. They start off as an aid to thinking, and gradually they become a replacement for thinking. If you go on to the next slide, very quickly, this is Procrustean. A bunch of engineers decide the best way to spend £6 billion improving the Eurostar, but it has to be a numerical measure. So it has to be something like duration, because the enjoyment of a journey doesn't have a numerical measure attached, so you can't construct a mathematical model. Now, I would argue putting Wi-Fi on the trains at about 0.05% of the cost would have improved the journey far more and differentiated you far more against the airlines. You could work, or even better, play Angry Birds. If you have angry birds, there's no point in having high-speed rail because it makes all time meaningless. Um, <laughs> but there are psychological solutions to this problem, which are much, much better. For £1 billion, pounds, you could employ all of the world's top male and female supermodels, get them to walk up and down the train, handing out free shatter for truce to all the passengers. You'd have £5 billion pounds left in change, and people would ask for the trains to be slowed down. <laughs> but none of, these, none of these solutions were investigated because they didn't actually allow for mathematical expression. Whereas duration and speed are mathematical things, and so we accord them an importance that they really don't deserve. Einstein said this, not everything that counts can be counted, not everything that you can count counts. But nonetheless, we have a world where actually the supremacy of mathematics as the international language means that if you stand up at a board meeting and you use an abstract noun, it's as if you just farted. Next slide. <laughs> This is a non-procrustean. This is actually an inspired behavioural experiment. In Korea, the traffic lights, the red traffic lights, count down. Why? It doesn't change the duration of the wait. It changes the psychological nature of the wait. If you know, the single best thing the London Underground did in terms of improving passenger satisfaction per pound spent was to put dot matrix displays on the platform. Trains aren't faster, they're not more regular, they're not more predictable, they don't run any later, but the simple psychological insight is that an eight-minute wait when you know it's eight minutes is a lot less painful than a four-minute wait when you're not sure if the train's coming at all. Uncertainty is the problem with waiting, not duration. That's a brilliant solution. The Chinese took it too far and they applied the same principle to green traffic lights. That's not a good idea. You're 200 <laughs> yards out and you've got four seconds left. Sure enough, the Koreans tested this, and they said, just do it with the red one. <laughs> um, all credit to that. Next slide. Now, I think the potential for 
if we allow more irrationality, less requirement for numerical uh, justification, and we start allowing people to design according to psychology rather than according to whatever mathematical justification actually allows you to keep your job in the event that uh, everything is a disaster. And that's what, let's face it, most rationalization is. It's a sort of self-protection mechanism within an institution, which is, well, if I, I know this is a bit dumb, but I won't get fired for it if I've got a model. That's basically how it works. You can actually create solutions to really small problems. And I think this is a great example. I said, if you want people to finish their antibiotics, don't give them 24 white pills, give them 18 white pills and six blue ones, and say, when you finish the white pills, take the blue ones. The chance that someone will finish any course of action is massively increased if there's a milestone in the middle. This is one of the biggest problems facing us, and no one has actually looked at the really important thing, which is not necessarily trying to develop new antibiotics, it's getting people to finish the course of antibiotics they've already been given. Next one. A beautiful example of this from Minnesota. I think this is what happens when your state is actually run by a professional wrestler rather than a professional politician. A very good idea, in my opinion. Um, in Britain, you have this problem when you have a contraflow, which is as soon as there's an indication that a, a lane merge is ahead, everybody has to merge early. And the reason for this is that if you don't merge early, people think you're queue jumping. Now, bear in mind, in Britain, queue jumping is somewhere on a par with paedophilia uh, in, the, uh, in the list of things that we really shouldn't do. And so everybody starts, and this causes the whole tail back, it causes massive uncertainty, and it causes the tail back to stretch back far longer than it need to. It makes totally inefficient use of road. What they did in Minnesota, the Americans are very good at this, they gave it a name, the zipper merge, because the idea is you should practice absolute self-interest up to the point of merger, at which point you switch to complete egalitarianism. So everybody goes right to the front of the queue, at which point it's one car at a time. It would be more efficient if it were ten cars at a time, because um, uh, actually that would be even quicker still, but it's just cognitively too difficult. So they make it the zipper merge, and everybody merges simultaneously, fantastically efficient. Next slide. The other thing to know about the human brain is it doesn't work as computers, engineers, other people, in the Newtonian way people think it should. Uh, which, slide, which of those two squares is darker, A and B? You all say A. Close it off, next two slides. Another one, and another one. What you'll see after a few seconds is not the most perfect truth. They're actually exactly the same color. But we perceive virtually everything, pain, pleasure, value, worth, pricing, at a relative level. Our instinctive perception is relative, not absolute. If you go back to the original, it's now impossible possible for you to see that, but it's nonetheless true. The one exception is people with perfect pitch, who are a very weird exception. But this relative thing is why Rolls-Royce don't sell cars at car shows. They look ridiculously expensive. You sell them at yacht and plane shows. Wandering around looking at Learjets for an afternoon, $300,000 car looks like a bargain. I'll have a couple of those. <laughs> Next one. Gappy love. Guppies make decisions. You, you've probably all been in some sort of meeting where someone gives you a form to help you make your decision, and it has nine measures all weighted in. Two minutes? Okay. Um, what we actually do here is guppies have three measures. They're a bit like the people from Essex. The first one is female guppies decide who to mate with. If, that, if one male is 40% bigger than another or more, they mate with a bigger one. If that isn't the case, they move on to a second heuristic, which is orangeness. They're rather like Essex people. They find orange pigmentation <laughs> spectacularly attractive, and they'll mate with the more orange one. If that one fails, because they're equally orange, they move on to social proof. And in that case, if they've seen that guppy mate with one of their friends, they'll sleep with that one, <laughs> on the basis that if, if it's good enough for her, it's good enough for me. That's how humans decide. We actually don't decide with weighted measures and by doing equations. We choose one heuristic first and move on. Final slide, then, in which case, that's lexicographical choice, effectively. When we decide whether the numbers are bigger, first one is one number longer than the other. If that, if that isn't the case, is the first digit bigger than the second digit? Third case, if the first two digits are the same, we move on to the second. In all three cases, the last two digits are completely ignored in decision making. So here's an interesting way in which you can exploit this. I'll leave you with this final slide. That's, that's my house. Um, now, just to be clear about it, it used to be the house of Napoleon III. I live in the attic, okay? So that little window, that little round window is my daughter's bedroom. We've got about three bedrooms up there. When people choose art, the artist is of paramount importance. When they choose property, they choose location first, then they look at the size of the house, the nature of the house, and architecture comes in at number nine in the guppy school of heuristic choosing. 
Therefore, to exploit this bias, I can give you all a piece of very good advice. If you want to buy art, buy architecture. The fact that that's by Robert Adam and his grade one listed and isn't just in Pevsner, it's got a photo in Pevsner, I would calculate adds about £5,000 to the cost of my three bedroom flat. That's because we choose heuristically and in order, not by actually calculating an equation. So if you want to buy art, buy architecture. Understanding these things can change the way in which we design legislation, but better still, it changes the way we can design lots and lots of things. Great advice from George Schultz. There's usually a simple alternative to an 80,000 page directive. If you want nuclear power stations to keep clean emissions, you could write an 80,000 page directive, as Schultz said, or you could simply insist that actually all their outflow has to be pumped into the river upstream. Thanks very much indeed.